Good morning, dear friends. Let's turn together to Ephesians chapter 6. We read today from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. I'll read from the King James, and then I'll follow the, in the discussion, I'll follow the uh, Darby translation. Ephesians 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, this promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to harass, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. Not with eye service, as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, this good will doing service as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good thing any man does, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. So far the reading of the scriptures. May the Lord bless his word. The word of God is so wonderful and always so practical. I just want to give you a little bit of the background. You saw in Ephesians. Ephesians is a really a highlight of Paul's ministry. And we saw the prayers. We saw also these long sections in this book. Very interesting. And we have seen that in chapter 1 to 3, he has developed the position that we have in Christ and the blessings that come along. And then in chapter 4 we have seen how we need to put these things into practice in our daily walk. And there we have seen the requirements uh, of humility and so on in chapter 4 and that we can together uh, express what the Lord is in heaven. That's really the challenge or the privilege we have. The Lord Jesus is now in heaven. And he expresses himself through all the members. So all the members of the body on this earth, we belong to that body. The Lord Jesus himself in, the, in heaven is expressing himself through you and me, through all the believers. He needs all the believers to express himself completely. No one can ever express the Lord Jesus completely. That's impossible. And he is now in the glory and he wants to use the believers today that they together may express something of himself. And actually, the Acts 2, the beginning of the church, till the rapture, all these members, those millions of members, together for eternity, will reflect the beauties of the Lord Jesus. And the privilege we have is to already do that now. And then we have seen in chapter 5, this relationship we have with the Father, with God the Father, and that we may walk in love, then we have seen also that we may walk in light and that we may walk in wisdom. We've seen that in Ephesians 5. And then we have come the last time to the end of Ephesians 5 where we have seen the relationship between Christ and the church and how that relationship is reflected in the relationship between husband and wife. And so that is the setting that we have seen before us. And I just want to uh, recap a little bit the, the context. We have the truth of the assembly, and that is then reflected in uh, verses 22 to verse 33 in connection with the husband and wife relationship. It reflects the relationship, relationship between Christ in heaven and the members on this earth. And so that is part of the circles in which we are. But then we see also that we have seen chapter 4, actually, uh, our, our walk in connection with our, blood, our brothers and sisters, the family of God. And so we are in the family of God, but in that family of God there is a special section 
and that is the family. And then we see how everything fits together in these three different circles. The assembly, the home, and then also we we'll see in connection with chapter 6, verse 5, the relationship between masters and bondmen, we see there the society in which we live. So we have a community of faith, that's where we are as believers, we are there all the time. And then we have a community of life in the family, and so those who are single, they belong to the community of faith, but they don't have that relationship as we have between wife and husband or father and children. But then we have also, in this world that we are, a community where we work. So we reflect something of the Lord Jesus in those three different settings. We reflect something of the Lord Jesus in the setting of the local assembly. And that is a tremendous privilege and a tremendous challenge to show the features of the Lord Jesus in the context of our relationship with each other. And then we have this privilege to reflect something of Christ in the relationship of the family, husband, wife, parents, children. So that's a great privilege. And we learn this way also of God who is Father. And for earthly fathers, we learn from God the Father. And then also mothers learn from the Lord Jesus, from this commitment, and may in that context reflect something of Him. But then also, as he said earlier, we are in this world in the relationship of work, community of work. And so we'll talk about that more in chapter 6. But then one more thing before we go on to chapter 6, I want to say this. We are also in the kingdom of God. And as the Lord Jesus now in heaven, glorified in heaven, he's the head of the body, we are also his disciples. We are in his kingdom. And there's a great privilege that we are, uh, have a relationship with the Lord Jesus as the King, and there's a relationship of love. We find that He is everything in the kingdom of God. This is not the kingdom as it will be manifested in public display in the millennium, in the world to come. This is now the kingdom of God, but the Lord Jesus has authority, we will recognize His authority, although others reject His authority. And so this is a great privilege to be disciples in the kingdom of God. So we have, we submit to him as head, that is connected with the assembly. We submit to him as Lord, that is in connection with the kingdom. And they both go together. These are different spheres, as it were, but they overlap in a certain sense, and they go together. For example, if I am not a disciple in the kingdom of God and submit to the Lord Jesus to his rights, how can I function practically in connection with the truth of the assembly? You need to be a good disciple in the kingdom of God in order to put into practice God's ideas, God's principles, God's thoughts concerning the assembly. The two go together. So, when we start now at chapter 6, where the children are addressed, I just want to say this in general. We see in those three different spheres that he mentioned, the uh, relationship uh, father, uh, husband and wife, and then the relationship parents-children, and then the relationship masters and servants, we see that those who are in subjection are addressed the first. So the wife is addressed the first. We saw that last time in chapter 5.22. Wife, submit yourselves to your own husband, as to the Lord. But then we have seen that that only functions in the context of verse 21, submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of Christ. So that uh, concept of submission is for all of us. But then it is applied here in this context to the wives, and then later on the husbands are addressed in their responsibility as the head, and they need to love their own wives, verse 25. We saw that in the last study. So the wives are addressed. They need to have this attitude of submission, and that's a tremendous challenge. But then also, the husbands are addressed, love your own wives, and I think that's even a greater challenge, even as 
Christ also loved the assembly. Is that not a greater challenge? But my point is, we both need to have this attitude of submitting ourselves to one another in the fear of Christ. Without that attitude, it cannot function. And so then, to draw the line to the children, now in chapter 6, we see parents and children, but the children are addressed first, because they are in a position of submission, and they are addressed first to encourage them. And then, when you come to verse 5, in chapter 6, the servants are addressed first, okay, because they are in the position of uh, submission, and so they are addressed first. That is to encourage God's order. And so let's talk about chapter 6, verse 1, a little bit. This is a relationship that God has introduced in creation already. This goes back to Genesis 2. And so this relationship God has addressed there already, before sin came into the world, this relationship of the family is there. But then they didn't have children yet. Adam and Eve got children after the fall. And so we are in a world marked by sin, and it is for everyone, every believer, a challenge to function according to God's concept, not according to the concept of the prince of this world, or the God of this age. So that's a challenge for all of us. Every believer has this great challenge, but also great privilege to display those features that we mentioned earlier, the features of the Lord Jesus in heaven, are to be ex expressed in the believers whether they are children, or parents, whether they are masters or servants. And so here the challenge is to obey. You know, the point of obedience is so important in Scripture. Uh, I'll just read a verse in John 3, verse 36. John 3, 36. It's a well-known passage. John 3 is this beautiful verse. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. In that same chapter, John 3, 36, what do we read? He that believes on the Son has life eternal, but he that is not subject or does not obey to the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides upon him. So, believe is really obey. You believe on the Son, you put your trust in him, and that is obedience. But you don't, if you don't believe, you don't submit to him, you don't obey, then you will not see life. And the wrath of God abides on you. So that's a tremendous, serious matter. If I don't want to obey, and I'm talking about for the children too, you know, that's a challenge. If you don't want to obey, you have a problem, not only with your parents, you have a problem with God. Because God has given the structure of the family. God has introduced these principles of, of obedience. And so God wants us to obey. And if you don't learn obedience as a child, you'll never learn it. And it, it, it will get harder and harder. So this is a principle in God's ways. You better learn to submit to your parents when you're young and obey. It says, your parents, so that is father and mother. And then it says, if you compare it to uh, Colossians 3, verse 20, it says, in all things. Once we remember, we had a, a memory verse, and that verse was uh, read then by one of the young people, and when he had to read that verse, in all things, obey in all things, he had a hard time to read that verse. Because he was challenged by that verse, you know. And it's a challenge for all of us. Colossians 3.20. And here it says, in the Lord. Because at the same time that is in the, this context that the family is under the Lord, and so the children are placed under the authority of the parents, and that is in the Lord, that's in fellowship with the Lord. Even the unbelieving children are in that family to obey because that's God's order, whether they like it or not. Okay? Now, of course, that obedience cannot be enforced with harsh measure. That obedience must be there in the uh, context of love, as we saw earlier. But it is very important 
to obey both parents, uh, father and mother, and not play them out one against the other. And so this is a challenge for uh, children to obey, but it's also a challenge for parents to uh, create that environment, that atmosphere in which they can learn to obey. And then the verse goes on to say, this is just, I said earlier, we are in the kingdom of God. A family here on earth is only one of the, the, uh, el, uh, the parents' believers. That family is placed in God's kingdom. And the whole family belongs to the Lord. That's why Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 7 that if only one partner is a believer, the whole family is now part of the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God, and holy, set apart for God. And they say the children are holy. And so some believe the children need to be baptized because of that. That's a human conclusion. It doesn't say that. It says that the children are holy, set apart to God. Of course, they all need to come to their own conviction to be saved and then to be baptized, but that's a different matter. But the point is, in the Lord, that means His authority is accepted and we submit to it. Parents, you give the example, the children learn from the parents, and so this is exercised in fellowship with the Lord, in communion with the Lord. This is precious to God, because this whole world in which we are is in disarray, in disorder. But when God looks then on the family where this is maintained, it's his delight, it's his joy when he sees that. And it is for our own blessing, and that's why it is added in verse uh, 2, that it may be well with you. Okay? So, but there's a difference between obeying and honoring. I checked it out, this verb to obey in the Greek text is used 21 times in the New Testament. And this word to honor, this verb to honor, is also used 21 times in the New Testament. So there is a balance there. But it's not the same thing. You obey, but there may be a situation that you cannot obey, and then you need to still honor your father and mother. That will never stop. So the two go together, of course, but they are not the same. And to just make that connection, it's not said to the wife to obey her husband. It's said to the wife, we saw that in Ephesians 5, to submit. But this honoring is valid, of course, for all of us. We need to honor God in the different relationships that he has placed us as children, as parents, as brothers and sisters. We need to honor God, and then we can also honor one another. And here in this context of the family, we can honor Children can honor the father and the mother, and the parents show respect. They are not dictators, but they show respect because in doing this they honor God. This is God's order. And so when God's order is maintained, it is for his honor and it's for our own blessing. So this obedience is specially addressed to the children, but then this honor is always valid, even if there are situations that you cannot obey. Verse 2 goes on to say that this is the first commandment with a promise. So God adds a promise to that commandment, to honor the father and the mother. And that's in God's government. In God's government, he will always honor those who submit to his order. God will honor that. And that's why he quotes the Old Testament, that it may be well with you and that you may be a long life on the earth. Actually, that is really uh, literally a reference to the world to come, to the millennium. And people will live for a thousand years. They live a long life. When they c commit themselves to God's rules and God's order, they will obey him and they will live a long life. We know from scripture that someone who is born again in the, in, the, in the world to come, in the millennium, when he's a hundred years old and has not yet believed, not obeyed, he will be killed. And if someone rises up against God and is disobedient, he will be killed the same day. And so this matter of obedience and submission is very important in God's eye because God wants order. And when there is order, 
there will be blessing. So you can see in the book of Proverbs, you find many, many uh, instructions that speak about the direct connection between obedience and uh, blessing. So this is God's order. And in God's government, although in this world everything in this order is, everything is upside down, God will maintain his thoughts and will bless those who want to put his thoughts into practice. That's God's government and God's ways with us. And then in verse 4 it says, ye fathers. So now the fathers are addressed. I said earlier, first those who are in submission are addressed, the children. But now the fathers are addressed. And that is a very special challenge not to provoke. See, if I say something to my children, but I don't do it myself, I provoke them. If I say, you should not do this, but I do it myself, you should not lie, but I, they notice that I'm, I'm lying all the time. That is uh, provoking. Of course, you can give other examples that you can provoke children by very harsh uh, behavior, by, uh, by tyrannical uh, behavior, that's also uh, provoking them. But I think in this, this context especially when we are inconsistent, when we say something but we don't do it, then we provoke them to anger. And the positive side connected with this is bring them up in the discipline and admonition of the Lord. So that is, again, the challenge for the fathers. In our society, this is often delegated to the mothers. And that's wrong. The fathers have this responsibility as head of the house to bring them up. Of course, the mothers are closely involved in that. You cannot separate them, but this, the responsibility goes to the father. Okay? And it says, bring them up. And the word that's used here in verse 4, to bring them up, is the same word that we saw in chapter 5 in connection with the assembly. In verse, chapter 5, verse 29, um, excuse me, nourish. So the husband is to nourish his wife, to take care of her, and in that same, that same word is used here in chapter 6, verse 5, verse 4, for the bringing up of the children, in that nurture, in that nourishing way. But then also in admonition, that admonition is uh, connected with uh, paideia, discipline. So that is teaching. But some among us, you are teachers, pedagogues. And so this is how God wants the fathers to be pedagogues, to bring them up in this way. Admonition is uh, not the whole concept yet, but this Discipline is this nurture, is a discipline of the pedagogue. But the admonition is connected with the mind, to set the mind right. So God wants us, fathers, to help our children to have their mind set right. And that's where correction comes in, and they're not going the right way. But it's always in a positive uh, context, it's of the Lord. This correction, this teaching, this nurture, this discipline is of the Lord. So the father really represents the Lord and the mother too, of course. The parents, they represent the Lord. The children, when they grow up, they cannot see the Lord. But in the parents, they see something of the Lord. That's the order that we find here. God's order is reflected then in the parents, the way they, uh, they teach. And then it is accepted by the children as they submit to this. It's a tremendous privilege that God's order can be maintained in the family while in this world everything is in disorder. Everything is in rebellion against God. So this is a tremendous privilege, at the same time a tremendous challenge to work this out. And I must say, I personally, I have failed in many ways, but this is God's thought. He wants us to uh, go with the uh, concept that he has, this, this uh, blueprint that God has, and that blueprint is always correct. God's thoughts are always correct. So we fail in uh, applying them, 
But God's blueprint, God's concept is always correct. So we always need to go back to what he is teaching here. And so God is the one who disciplines, the one who trains. That applies also, of course, to the assembly and to the church in general. But here you find it in connection with the family, with the home. And a happy home is where Christ has this uh, central place and where the Lord Jesus is honored this way and then things will fall into place. But just one word before we go on to verse uh, 5. The children are addressed and that implies all the children. But sometimes parents make a, a, a difference between unbelieving children and believing children. Yeah, of course there is a difference. But all the children are addressed. So if you have a child who is not a believer yet, doesn't mean that you should not apply these principles. Of course, when they get older, they have to make their own decision. And, but when they learn to obey very young, then when they get older, they will follow that path. Like you have in the book of Proverbs, a beautiful verse, train the child in the way it should go. When it gets older, it will not depart from it. So I mentioned earlier, Proverbs is a, is a book that is very helpful in this connection. So then we go on to verse 5, the bondmen, or literally slaves, in the King James it's servants. But the literal meaning is bondmen. So that's not a concept that God had at the beginning of creation when he introduced mar the marriage relationship in Genesis 2. The concept of uh, bondmen came later because of the fall. But God is not going to change things in the world that has to wait till the world to come. Then God will force the, the whole world to submit to his thoughts. But in this day of grace, God takes a situation like that and he doesn't want us to become activists to force the world to change and to, uh, to s stop uh, the, the concept of bondmen. That would be wrong if we try to enforce this on the society in which we are. But God says, you know what? If you become a believer, you are a bondman, it is an opportunity to you to display the beauties of Christ. Just read the verse in Titus. In the book of Titus, you have a great encouragement for these bondmen. In Titus chapter 2, Verse 9, where Paul speaks to, to Titus, and Titus needs to instruct the servants then. In the King James it says, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters, and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. Verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So what Paul is saying here is the servants or the bondmen, the slaves, they had a very special opportunity. When they became believers, they were now placed in a situation where it was very difficult, but in that situation they could uh, adorn the doctrine of God. So they have received God's grace and now they can show to their masters how they have changed. In the past they would answer back or they would protest or they would curse the master and now the master says, what happened? He's obedient, he does everything what I say and he does even more than I ask. What happened? So that is a tremendous testimony to the masters to see the change in the servant and that's why it says that they may adorn the doctrine of God. So this grace of God, the doctrine of God, is now displayed by these servants. A so difficult situation. And so God does not want us to become activists to change this world. He wants us to function according to his thoughts in the situation that we are, that we may honor the Lord, may honor God in that context. Of course, when a slave then can... Uh, uh, pay his master to uh, be a free man, Paul is not against that. He explains that in 1 Corinthians 7 and other scriptures. But the point is, 
In that context, he can start right away to adorn the doctrine of God. And so apply that now to the children. But in a situation of obedience, if you have an unbelieving father or an unbelieving mother, but you have become a believer, you have a tremendous opportunity to show what the grace of God means, who the Lord Jesus is. And so there have been situations that parents were saved by the behavior of their children who had become believers. So this is what I just want to uh, tie in with Ephesians 6 verse 5, that those who are in a position of but they need to obey the children, verse 1, the bondmen, the slaves in verse 5, are in a very special uh, situation where they can honor God even better than others can. And so here the challenge is for the bondman to obey these masters according to the flesh. And I said earlier, God does not uh, want us to be activate, activist and rebel, but he wants us to function in that situation, not that it is according to God's thoughts, but God uses that. One more thing, God uses that concept to show the Lord Jesus. He became the true bondman. You can see that in Isaiah, for example, where the Lord Jesus took the place of a bondman to honor God. He is the, the free man. He's the creator. And he took the position of a bondman to honor God. Now, if the Lord Jesus could do that, then also the servants or the bondmen here in Ephesians 6 verse 5 can do that, following the Lord's example. And so they say, obey the masters according to the flesh. The Lord Jesus, you can read in Psalm 40, you can read Isaiah 50 and other scriptures, how wonderful the Lord Jesus honored God. And even in the days of Moses, the, there was a scripture that Moses gave, the Lord gave to Moses in Exodus 21, speaking about the bondman. The bondman who loved his master so much that he didn't want to, love, to leave his master. He wanted to keep serving his master. That's a tremendous testimony of love. And that is to the honor of God. And that's the context here of Ephesians 6 verse 5, that the bondman can honor God by obeying his master, according to the flesh. And he does that. There are seven points just highlighted there. First of all, with fear. So this fear implies not that he's afraid, but this fear implies that he realizes his own shortcomings, his own failures, that is prompt to fail, and he does that with trembling, therefore he does not want to fail. He does it also in simplicity, that is, the focus is on the Lord, so he does not, he's not double-minded, he focuses on the Lord. He says in his heart, you know, I represent the Lord here, I'm a servant here, I'm a slave, and I obey my master, but I do that with simplicity, my eye is fixed on the Lord. And that simplicity is connected with the heart. It's connected with the soul also in these verses. And so this is really important for all of us to have this kind of simplicity. This is the simplicity of faith. So I may extend it now a little bit. I take the teaching for the bond servant. I apply it to all of us. Because we are all bond servants of the Lord. And the Lord wants us to have that attitude of the bond servant here in verse 5. That same fear uh, not relying on yourself, not boasting, but trembling in the sense, realize your weakness, your, how you are fallible, failing persons, the simplicity of the heart, fixing our eyes on the Lord Jesus, we need to do that all the time. And then in verse 6, not as eye service, as man pleasers. See, the danger was for a slave to um, just please his master when he was around. But when he was gone, he would not do what was pleasing to the master. That is eye service. God doesn't want that. That is man pleaser. You know, the Lord Jesus, I mentioned his example as the true bond servant. The Lord Jesus could say in John 8, verse 29, I do always the things that please him, that please God. And so the Lord Jesus was always in God's presence, always doing God's Bidding what God was pleased in. That's why God opened the heavens when he was baptized by John the Baptist. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And the Lord Jesus continued on doing everything to the glory of God, pleasing him all the time. And so now we are 
in this scene to serve one another here as servants, to serve the master, not with eye service as man pleasers, but as bondmen of Christ. So this servant here realizes, you know, I'm a bondman, this is my master, but my real master is in heaven. And the real master, I want to please him. And while I please the real master, I also please the master here in the flesh. That's the point, okay? And so we maybe follow this example, realize that our real master is in the Lord. Whatever we need to do, we need to please him as bondmen of Christ. And so we are all bondmen of Christ. Are we here to please him? That's a challenge for us. Often we please men or we try to please ourselves or to please the brethren. No, we are here to please the Lord. And then we can be a blessing to each other. Doing the will of God from the soul. So that's why I said earlier, heart and soul is connected with this. That's the right mindset. And then in that context we can do the will of God. And then we will be blessed. So doing the will of God is not only desiring to do the will of God, but actual doing it. And there is a difference. We, often we have good desires, but we fail in doing. The Lord Jesus said that to the disciples. Uh, when you know these things, blessed are you when you do them. And the Lord says that to me. Because we can know certain things, but if we don't do them, we are even in debt towards God and to one another. So the Lord wants us to be doers of the word. John 1, 21, uh, James 1, 21, be doers of the word and not only hearers deluding yourselves. So the Lord wants us to be doers of the word, doing the will of God. If there is one on this earth who did the will of God, the Lord Jesus, he came into this world to do God's will. Psalm 40. That was his motive, to do the will of God. And so he's our great example and encouragement in following him. And then serving. Here the word serving is in verse uh, 6. As bond servant. So doing the will of God and with good will from the soul, serving as slaves. That is the word used here. The verb here is serving as slaves with good will. So this is also for us to be true bondmen, to serve God with this devotion, with this commitment, and do it as to the Lord. That is the challenge. So this servant needed to do everything to please the Lord. He did everything as to the Lord. So as I said earlier, his earthly master, he wanted to please him, but first of all, he wanted to please the true master. And then he was pleasing the true master, en passant, he would also please his earthly master. And so apply that now to us at school. If you do what you're supposed to do, you want to please God in doing what you're supposed to do. If you are in, in a business or at school or wherever you are, you want to do the things in this, with this perspective to please the Lord in what you are doing. And that's a challenge for all of us to, even on the roads or wherever we are, to please the Lord in what we are doing. And so then, we serve Him as true bond servants. We do the good will of the Lord. And then we will honor him even when there is, uh, when there is opposition, we honor the Lord. Verse 8, knowing that whatever good each shall do, this he shall receive of the Lord, whether bond or free. So he will have a reward. Verse 8. So that is... The one who makes the final assessment is God. And so if you do a good thing, you have to leave the results with God. Sometimes it takes a long time before we see the results of something that you're doing. But if we do it in this, with this uh, perspective, it says, The same shall you receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. So uh, this is a principle that's now applied to all of us, whether we are in the social relationship, the social structure, that you have to serve a master. But it is applied now to all of us that we would do what is good, and then we will receive the reward 
from the Lord when that time has come. So then we close this verse 9 for today. Now the masters are addressed. So we've seen first the children, then the parents, first the bond servants, then the masters. And so now the masters are addressed in verse 9. And what is striking here, he speaks it to masters who are believers, of course. He does not speak to the unbelieving masters. He speaks to masters who have become believers, and they need to do the same things to the slaves. That means they have to have the same attitude. The master is serving the true master. And just a little story that comes back to my mind uh, that's really helpful, this illustration, that was way back in England, in the early days when the so-called brethren movement started there, there were very high-ranking people, like a count or uh, very high-ranking people, and they usually had servants. And what happened in this case, the... Uh, this gentleman who was a count, he had a servant who would drive him to the meeting. And this servant also got saved, and he had the gift of teaching. And so what happened then, the servant would bring his master to the assembly, and they would sit down, and the master would sit in the second row, and the servant would sit in the fourth row, because he had this gift of teaching. And so then, when the meeting was over, the servant would still help his master, the brother who he was serving, and honor him. He honored him. And this master honored his servant also in accepting that he had this gift of teaching and said, therefore, in the first row in the assembly. So this is just a little illustration of this point. The servants are addressed, but then also the masters are addressed, and it's a challenge for both, of course. And the challenge is also a privilege. Because sometimes, when you are in the context of an assembly, and you have, uh, this is my boss, and, but he's a believer, but I'm also a believer, and so there is something I have in common with him. I'm just sim similar like he is. But I still have to honor him because he is also my boss. Okay? So there's a challenge for us to, to practice these things into the different settings where we are in this society. That if we seek to honor the Lord, God will always honor that. Okay? So if we close this verse 9, masters do the same things towards them. That means the same attitude. The masters have the same attitude towards the servants. And so they should give up threatening. Threatening, we should not do. I've been guilty of that. Sometimes threaten my children. That's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. It's not helpful at all. And so here in the servant, the servant... Uh, there's such a master, if the master would threaten him, and the master is a believer, it's a sign of weakness. He should never do that. And not only that, it says, knowing that both there and your master is in heaven. So, the believing master, the believing servant, they both have this privilege to honor the Lord, the true master, in heaven. And with this master, there is no acceptance of persons with him, there is no favoritism. So this is the privilege that we all have in whatever position we are. Whether you are a teacher at school or, or a student, whether you are a boss in the society where we are, or you are a servant, this is a tremendous privilege that we serve the same master, although we have different positions in this society. And he makes no exception of persons. He is not... Uh, in this society, people are easily guilty of favoritism. And they look the eyes, oh, that, that is my boss, you know. I, and then behind his back, you don't honor him at all. That's not right at all. And the same for the master. If the master has favorites, that's not right either. So this is a tremendous challenge for us to put these things into practice in the society where we are. And I close with this. We have seen the different circles in which we are in the assembly, there are great challenges. We need to deal with one another and reflect the beauties of Christ as members of his body. Then in the home, we have challenges and privileges. We saw that. And then in the society where we are, to function as masters or as servants, let's say this as employers and employees, 
we have to function according to these thoughts and then submit to the headship of Christ in the assembly and submit also to his lordship as we are in the kingdom and to reflect him here on this earth. So may the Lord help us that we may function according to this pattern. Then we will be blessed and we will be a blessing to one another as well. So if there are questions or comments or things that I skipped, please go ahead. And thank you for your attention. So, indeed, uh, the verse that you just quoted goes well together with this verse uh, in Ephesians 6, verse 5, so that the bond servant is subject to the master, even if the master shows a wrong attitude, even if he has uh, favoritism, this principle of submitting to the master is always there. But I, I agree with you, in this context, is the unbelieving master. And Peter, in chapter 3, goes also to the marriage relationship, there's an unbelieving husband, and then the wife can gain him by her attitude of submission. Okay? And so the master here, who is an unbeliever, is harsh, failing, he can be gained because of the right uh, attitude of the servant. Any other thoughts about that? Or addition? Yeah. Well, that one in Deuteronomy 5, 60, yeah. order of the I think so. I, I would think so. Yeah. And that's why I said it's also related to the millennium, to the world to come. But the same principle will be uh, followed, and God will enforce that same principle in the world to come. Now it is our privilege to put this principle into practice in a world where everything is in opposition to God. But the same idea that it may be well is a principle in God's government. And that God's government is already today. God sees when there is this obedience, when there is these challenges. God will honor those who submit to his principles. And so that is the, the idea that uh, is, of course, in the millennium that will be perfect. Then obedience will be perfectly be rewarded. Disobedience will be uh, not rewarded, of course. But this principle is in God's ways. And that is why Paul quotes this from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy has in view the world to come, that God's rule will be accepted, God's government. And now he says, in, Paul says, as it were, we already, in that sense, live in the millennium. We don't live in the millennium physically, but we are subject to the same principles already now, because we're in the kingdom of God. Temptations, we quote it from Deuteronomy. Thank you. Other things or questions? Uh, and Ephesians 6. First of all, my thoughts are not important. <laughs> it's really about, <laughs> no. It's really what does the Word of God say? And the Word of God shows there was failure all around. There was failure with Isaac. There was failure with Rebecca. There was failure with Jacob. There was failure with Esau. At the same time, God has a plan, and God is going to fulfill his plan. And so God overrules. He sees those failures, but through it all, he will fulfill his plan. And so he gives the blessing to Jacob, not because Jacob deserved it, but that was God's plan, that the second would be blessed instead of the first. Is that, is that the principle of election, then? That yes. Yeah. 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 But then later on, Isaac saw the things right in chapter Genesis 28. Absolutely. And so the same is Abram. Abram and, um, and Sarah, they failed in Genesis 16 when she said, take Hagar, it's a bond servant. There was failure all around. Yeah, they want to help God, but the God doesn't need that help. We need to submit to his thoughts. That's the challenge. What he says is what it is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Any other point? And with learning obedience and suffering. I would say so in this world where we are, that those who stand for God's rights will have to suffer. And of the Lord Jesus, of course, he learned obedience through suffering because as the Creator God, he was always commanding. And now he was in a position of submission that he had to learn what obedience is. It doesn't mean that the Lord Jesus ever failed or had the tendency to not to obey, but he learned what obedience means in that 
situation on this earth. So we have to keep that in mind also. The Lord Jesus never failed, but the point that you mentioned earlier, that obedience, if you want to honor God's right, it will imply suffering. And that can be in a home that the wife does not accept the, the order of God's, uh, God's order, or vice versa, that the husband does not accept God's order, then there is suffering. And you want to keep going. And that's a tremendous challenge because the flesh is in us, you know. So how easily it is to react in a carnal way, which is not helpful at all, of course. So if Abram failed, if Sarah failed, if Isaac failed, if Rebecca failed, if Jacob failed, and, and so on and so on, who are we? We will, we will fail. But the word of God shows us what his thoughts are, and God wants to help us to put his thoughts into practice despite all the failures, despite our tendencies to go wrong. So may the Lord help us. We can only cast ourselves on Him. But He's faithful. He will honor those who want to honor Him. But, it, but the challenge remains that in that setting we need to reflect Christ's thoughts. So not uh, attack the society or not attack rulers, but to display in our behavior what God's thoughts are without words. And that you find with the woman who is submissive, she will gain her husband because of that right attitude. And so that's the challenge for us. If we are op uh, uh, facing opposition, how do we respond to that? In what manner do we respond to that?